In this video, we're going to be covering some examples of important arithmetic functions. And in the last video, we met our first important example, which was the Euler totient function. Now, the first function that we're going to meet is the divisor function. And I actually don't know of any like super standard notation, uh, so I'm just going to write d of n. And what this is going to do is count the number of prime, uh, sorry, the number of positive divisors of n. So, for example, let's say we have d of 12. Well, 12 has the divisors 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. So d of 12 is 6. Now, this is all fine and good. And remember in the last video, when we defined the Euler totient function, it was initially in words like this. Like, we were counting something, some numbers that have some property in relation to n. And we want to find some useful, more useful way of interpreting d of n. And for the Euler totient function, we achieved that by looking at the prime factorization of n. And in fact, we can do that again to study this function. And this is going to be a common theme in the study of arithmetic functions, dealing with specifically prime numbers. Because remember, for functions that are multiplicative or additive, we can break them up over the prime powers that divide into n. And it will turn out that d of n here is multiplicative. So let's look at a prime factorization for n. And let's just write it like this. p1 to the a1 times dot 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 pk to the ak. So we have k distinct primes, uh, p1 through pk, and their respective exponents are a1 through ak. Now, how do we figure out how many divisors this number has? Well, it would help to sort of break down this example that we did here by looking at it in terms of the prime factorization. So we have 2 squared times 3. So these are our p's and these are our a's. Now, if we look at the divisor list, how many of these numbers, uh, well, I guess what we want to do is think of what are the prime factorizations of these divisors? In fact, right, if we take any number on this list, let's call it r. If we're given that r divides into n, this is the same as saying that the greatest common divisor between r and n equals r. And for the greatest common divisor in prime factor, if we were to factorize both of the numbers, so we know a factorization for a, right, or I mean n, uh, and let's say r is something like q1 to the qm, b1 to the bm, right? When we take the greatest common divisor like this, we're essentially just picking out uh, prime powers that match, right? So let's take an explicit example. Let's say we wanted to compute the greatest common divisor of 12 and 16. This would be 2 squared times 3, and this would be 2 to the 4. As we can see, 2 squared, well, 2 is the prime that they share. And then between the two prime powers, 2 squared and 2, two to the fourth, 2 squared is the biggest one that fits. Fits both of them. So the greatest common divisor is going to be 2 squared. So what this means is that if the greatest common divisor between these two numbers, r and n, is equal to r, then that means that these primes q 
have to form a subset of the primes p. It also means that these exponents b and the respective primes have to be smaller than the exponents a, right? Because as we saw, when we're choosing between 2 squared and 2 to the fourth, we have to pick the smallest number because that's the one that's going to fit both. That's the one that's going to divide into both. So if we have a number that divides into n, for instance, if we have a number that divides into 12, then we know that r is going to be 2 to the a times 3 to the b, where a can equal 0, 1, or 2, and b can equal 0 or 1. And this, as we can see, choosing a's and b's in this fashion directly corresponds to each of the numbers on this list, right? If we pick a and b to be 0, we get 1. If we pick a equals 0 and b equals 1, we get 3, and so on. And since there are three numbers in this list and two numbers in this list, overall we get six numbers. So the quick way to find d of n is to put it in, prime, in its prime factorization and simply raise each exponent and then multiply them together. Because any divisor of n will share these prime factors these prime powers, but the powers will be less, right? The, each exponent will range from zero to ai for each prime. So we just choose the exponents, and in that, in that fashion, we get a formula for d of n. And I'm not going to show it here, but you can use this idea to show that d of n will be multiplicative. Because if two numbers are co-prime, then their primes will be distinct. And so when you multiply them together, essentially the factors in D of n that correspond to each exponent of a prime, those won't overlap. Now let's look at the next example. And this is going to be the sum, uh, let me write it like this. This, uh, the sum over the divisors of n. In other words, just the sum of the, divis the positive divisors of n. So again, let's take the example of 12, right? We have the divisors 1, 2, 3, uh, 4, 6, and 12. So their sum will be, right, uh, 22, 6, 28. And once again, we're going to find a way of writing this in a nice way using prime factorization. So again, let's just consider the general prime factor form. And what we have here, right, once again, all these divisors are going to be numbers um, in the form 2 to the a times 3 to the b, right? So let's group them up. Let's take first all the numbers that don't have a factor of 3. Okay, so we get 1 plus 2 plus 4. And now these other numbers, 3, 6, and 12, have a, th a shared factor of 3. So let's factor out that 3 we get 1 plus 2 plus 4. Now we have this common factor of 1 plus 2 plus 4. And if we factor that out, we get 1 plus 3. So what's happening here? Right, as we saw before, the possible values of a were 0, 1, and 2, and the possible values of b were 0 and 1. And now we're showing that sigma of 12 is equal to 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 2 times 3 to the 0 plus 3 to the 1. And this idea works in general. We can write out the sum of the divisors 
and f and factorize with respect to each uh basically we look at a fixed exponent and factor that out and you can repeat that factorization no matter how many primes you have so sigma of n in general is going to be 1 plus p1 plus dot 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 plus p1 to the a1 times dot 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 1 plus pk plus dot 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 pk to the ak. And once again, since each of these factors corresponds to a single prime, we can see that sigma is going to be multiplicative, because if I multiply sigma, or if I do sigma of xy, where x and y are coprime, then none of their primes will be the same, and so these factors will multiply uniquely. Finally, we have one last uh, multiplicative function to consider, and this is the Mobius function. And this is a very important function, and it has a very strange definition at first. So we are going to define it as equaling 1 if n equals 1, equaling negative 1 if um, n has, or sorry, negative 1 to the k if, neg if n has k distinct prime factors, and 0 if uh, some square number divides n for a bigger than 1. So some some square that's bigger than 1, right, basically. And so yes, this is a very weird definition for a function, right? And it's even weirder to say, to claim that this is actually multiplicative. So let's try and work on this, right? First of all, this condition here, a squared divides n, well, we can see that we can whittle this down to a slightly different condition that p squared divides n for some prime. And so if we write n again in this standard prime factored form, if we're saying that p squared divides n, right, we're essentially saying that for one of these pi's, so uh, this means that for some pi in the list of primes that divide n, the exponent ai is greater than 1, right? Because if one of these had an exponent of 2 or 3 or anything bigger, then pi squared would divide into n. So basically, mu of n is going to be 0 if any of the primes have an exponent bigger than 1 and it's going to be non-zero otherwise. So when we're analyzing, function, uh, analyzing a problem in terms of mu of n, and let's say it's like a sum, right? And we can ignore the parts where mu of n is zero. Then when we write n as this prime factored form, we can basically ignore all of the exponents. So if we know we know mu of n is not equal to 0, then we can write n as simply this product of primes. And technically write n equals 1 when it fit in this form, because 1 isn't a prime, it's not a product of primes, but this is a general form, right? It's essentially I mean, you could, center, you could consider 1 as sort of an empty product of primes, if you want to. And this is essentially the idea behind mu being a multiplicative function. Because if two numbers are coprime, 
right? Then they won't share any prime factors. So if either x or y has a squared prime factor, or a, a, prime, a prime that has a big enough exponent, right, bigger than 1, then so will xy. So essentially mu of xy, right, equals mu of x, mu of y. So if y has some factor, right, qi to the a, or the bi, I should say, and we know that bi is bigger than 1, right, then we know mu of y will be 0. And so will x of y, or xy, because xy is going to have this prime factor too. So this is also going to be 0. However, if we simply consider the case where neither x or y have uh, a prime power where the exponent is bigger than 1, then we know that x and y are just going to be a product of primes. And if we're given that they're coprime, right, because that's the condition for a multiplicative function, if we're given that they're coprime, then all of their primes have to be different. So x and y are a product of primes, and we, when we multiply them together, it's also just going to be a product of distinct primes, because all the primes are different in x and y, so they can't group up and form a prime power that has an exponent bigger than 1. So I hope these explanations make sense. Um, there's sort of some details I'm skipping. So if there's anything ever you don't understand, please be free, uh, feel free to comment. I, uh, I try to respond to as many comments as I can, you know, comments that are questions that I can answer. Sometimes I get questions that I can't answer. Um, but anyway, I hope to see you in the next video.